I came across a notice on the notice board in the main corridor and it said a talk is being given by Dr. Brian Morris and then it said underneath Dr. Morris is the anthropology department <laughs> and he was and I discovered that Brian had started as a, a kind of tame anthropologist because the psychology students needed to have and other subjects. I can remember teaching here in the evening and there was a steel band being played. And I can remember having coffee with Quasi Johnson, who's now a, a famous poet, you know. And, and so there was always that sort of links with, with, the, with the world around here, actually. I don't think the other three departments really thought another department was necessary. So they were gonna to tolerate us for a while and see what happens. Brian said, go and see the warden again and see if you can make any headway. We need another member of staff, at least one, if not two. So I went to see the then warden. He said, I've been looking at your teaching. You teach far too many courses. And I said, what? And he said, yes, all those specialisms. I said, but that's what we love most. We can't not teach them. Oh, go away, he said. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't win that one. I was warned not to be intimidated by Pat at the interview. She <laughs> might look very serious and ask very intimidating questions. But she did. <laughs> the fact that we were situated in these, these houses in Lewisham Way gave a kind of uh, intimacy to the department mm. by comparison to other places that I'd had anything to do with. I think there is an openness there, a kind of informality, which uh, is really helpful because it allows people to feel immediately like a part of the place. It was actually at the beginning just hoping to have a home to do research from. Just this idea that you can have an idea, think about it and, and, and go with it, which was just very liberating. Sometimes we're even considered sort of not necessarily proper anthropological. We had the rumours going around that they would throw out, they would throw out the sex and gender course. So we got that impression, and I can remember Pat being very, Pat being Pat, she sort of said, what are they going to argue against the sex and gender course? And what are they going to say? They're going to say that, this is how we respond. If they're going to say that, this is how we respond. But we didn't, it went through, didn't it? The study of the Caribbean was neglected at that time because it wasn't regarded as an area of proper study for social anthropology because its indigenous populations had been eradicated. We felt, certainly Brian and I discussed this many times ideologically, that anthropology wasn't just about the far away and the exotic, but it was about here and us. And one of the reasons we were very keen to establish Caribbean ethnography was not just to add another region to, um, uh, to the kind of repertoire, but it's also because here we are in Lewisham and there are an awful lot of people of African Caribbean heritage living in Lewisham and we wanted you know, we wanted to make those those kind of links. The closer it's got to other disciplines, the harder it's had to fight to police its boundaries, and that's okay. become a, an issue in anthropology. And Goldsmiths, which has yeah. ma mainly social science departments, in some sense is trying to overlap, but also not wanting to overlap too much, because they mm -hmm. might get lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is part of the dynamic of, the, yeah. of intellectual life here. And disagreements. <laughs> so I think there's this constant sort of search for innovation and opening up spaces. So I think that kind of pioneering mood of the, the, the founders is carried through. I think also they feel that we teach uh, in a way that we make anthropology relevant to, to everyday life. Mm. And I think that's something that yes. everybody makes a real effort yes. in this department. Sometimes some of the th things they say is, are, is, are very, um, very touching. You know, you taught me to think. You gave me to, to realize that there was, you know, you have to look underneath what's being said or what's being done. I mean, I can remember Brian and I arguing numerous times because you have to do something called First Destinations in October, which tells the powers that be where your last year's graduates have gone. Well, most of them were floating around the world looking at the places that they'd been reading about in anthropology, and we thought that was what they should be doing. We didn't think they should have been pinned down in a bank or an insurance office. It didn't office. look good on the record. But it, doesn't, it didn't look good on the record, absolutely. But we've always been deeply concerned about the students. I mean, we were the first department to have a mentoring scheme. We were a flagship department in that respect. When Richard Hoggart left the college, we sent him a little note, and just a little note of thanks. And he sent us, you and me, he sent us a little card, a little card, saying thank you very much. One thing he always liked was the, the dance party department. Olivia Harris, the third member of the department, who's been much mentioned. Um, she was my PhD supervisor and without question the reason I ended up 
becoming an anthropologist. And she told me an awful lot about Goldsmiths when she was supervising me. It was somewhere that she obviously held an enormous fondness for and I think regarded as having really formed her as an anthropologist and a, and a person. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled that I've been able to come back and, and, um, and teach her old course. It's been kind of uncanny, actually. It's been like um, coming to a home that you've never known.